Are you ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. Today we have Sean Hill. Now, Sean has the most astounding background story you'll find. He's written a whole uh, Twitter thread on that on his Twitter but he dives into a bit of that story and, and the ups and downs he's had, he's had in his journey from essentially going from about 20K a year working to now doing over 20K a month from his website as well as working alongside that at Forbes as an SEO strategist. But we just dive into uh, a bunch of different topics around his website, how he's done the content, how he's managed to build it to where it is today, some of the link building strategies as well and content strategies. We also go into a little bit on his email funnel uh, he's putting together on individual pages, so taking a step further than having a site-wide lead magnet or site-wide funnel. Um, we also go into probably the fastest business creation and selling uh, that's probably ever happened in history. He managed in 39 hours essentially create a new business using AI and sell it for five figures, which is uh, outstanding. It, You'll hear that story here as well of, of how he was able to do that through AI. And then we just go into some more general advice around working from home when you have family, kids, and all that stuff. So if you're in that uh, situation currently or you're going to be, that will be a great listen as well. So sit back and enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders show. That's nichewebsite.builders show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today, we have, I guess we could call you Twitter famous now, Sean Hill. Welcome, Sean. Hey, thank you. I don't know about famous, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're... you're yeah, you're getting a lot of engagement on there. It's great to have you on. You've I actually read through your your background story you posted on Twitter. I think it was actually a week or two ago. It was pretty recent. Um, and man, you've gone through a lot of shit to get to where you are today and to be making the amount you are today and to basically have that income coming in from, from your portfolio and, and other ventures. So do you want to maybe dive into a little bit of that background and kind of what, what you've gone through to get to where you are now, and then we can maybe dive into kind of what you're doing now and, and how you're bringing that money in. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I shared that really, I was just kind of thinking about the journey and just reflecting on it. I think that's pretty normal beginning of the year and, you know, looking back and um, just appreciating, you know, the growth that I've had. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with other people because I know that other people have backgrounds similar to mine. And I grew up with like a single alcoholic mom. Um, things weren't easy, you know, in childhood. And I won't go into a bunch of that, but like <laughs> after becoming an adult and, you know, my girlfriend, you know, I was going to college, she got pregnant. I was like, Hey, I got to find a job. <laughs> so I was like looking for anything possible. And from there, I mean, I, I did just about everything. I mean, I've worked at snack shops. I've had, you know, a landscaper, he paid me $10 an hour to pick up sticks. Um, I mean, I would do anything <laughs> to, you know, anything legal to try to, to make some money. And, you know, if I wasn't working, I was sleeping, um, you know, spraying pesticides and then taking a, a chance, you know, moving across the country to Oklahoma and working for an uncle 
girlfriend came with me, you know, the baby was only six months old and, you know, that only lasted a few months before I realized he was taking money out of my check and, you know, wasn't going to do that. Just wasn't fun. So came back to Indy, was living with my girlfriend's mom's boyfriend. This was a like 900 square foot house. Um, and it just, I mean, I just realized like, I, I have to do something. Um, and to be honest, like I was never particularly good at anything. Um, and I, I, all I had going for me was work ethic. So that's all I did. I just worked really hard, uh, at everything that I did. And, you know, from there, like finding a sales job, um, I worked for a Verizon store for about four months, uh, ended up being second in sales for year to date. Um, got promoted to a store manager, went to an outside sales role that collapsed. When I came back, they wanted me just to be a sales, um, rep again and just wasn't having it. So ended up somehow finding my way into the mortgage industry and was there for a few years. But, um, yeah, from there to advertising sales and, you know, there was just a day in advertising sales. I had become friends with one of the service providers I sold ads to and his business went under texted my wife. I'm like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. Um, I've got to find a way to, you know, help small business owners, uh, and cause it's not selling ads here at this company. Um, so I started a little marketing agency. I knew nothing about marketing really. Um, but I, I knew enough to know that like kind of what they needed and, you know, just getting to know them. I knew what revenue sources did work. Um, one of them they talked about was SEO. Didn't know much about it, uh, but figured I could learn. Um, so I started it up. I just literally reached out to people that I knew, um, somebody had replaced our roof. We hired them, um, you know, off the site I was working for, I'll just, you know, say it was Angie's list who I was working for. I'm careful, um, saying their name just cause some issues that happened after I started the agency, they told me like, I couldn't use their name on the site anymore. Um, anyway, yeah. So I, I hit up the person who replaced our roof and said, Hey, I'm starting a marketing agency. Like, would you be okay if I gave you a free marketing plan? And they loved it and said, how do we hire you? Uh, I didn't know at the time that they were part of a franchise. So I ended up going from like one client to 45 clients really fast. And I wow. thought it was really cool. And I was just managing their social media. That's all I did. Uh, and then they started asking, like, hey, do you do other things? Can you write blogs for us? Can you handle this? And it ended up just being something I didn't enjoy at all because I had 45 bosses telling me what to do. Um, and I you know, didn't have help. I didn't know how to hire people. I just, it was a mess. Um, while doing that though, I knew that I wanted to do something in the digital marketing space cause I enjoyed it. Um, I actually liked writing the blog post cause I started doing that for a couple of them. And I started reaching out in different Facebook groups, just asking people, you know, questions and trying to get advice. And, um, I met this guy named Brock McGough. He runs a site called the modest man. Um, I think it's cool saying that site name just cause his face is plastered all over it. Um, <laughs> He's running that. I mean, the site is brilliant. If you go to it now, I mean, it's still like my source of inspiration. Anytime I need like web design, like the site is just spot on. Um, and I just reached out just randomly. I'm like, Hey, I love your site. Like somebody told me about it, checking it out. Is there any way like you could coach me? Like I'll pay you. And he basically said, no, but I have a coach and I, I think he has a course that's open. And that dude's name is Shane Dudka. And so I reached out to Shane, like got on the phone call. He did have a course at the time um, and then took the course. I paid him to coach me for about a year. And that's, you know, while taking that course, I just followed it step by step. Uh, and that's how I started building, you know, my first niche site. And, um, you know, after about a year, it was making about a thousand dollars a month. Um, and he, you know, I reached out and asked him a question and he said, Hey, this is uh, the type of question you know, an SEO analyst here at this company that I'm working for, you know, it's a question that they would ask Have you ever thought about doing SEO for a living. And I just was kind of like, yeah, I mean, this is really fun. Like I'm really enjoying it, but you know, I'm still working this other job that I don't really like, you know, in telesales. And, um, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I ended up working for, um, that company who has partnerships with some really large sites. Um, so I, you know, got my hands dirty in SEO and learning all about it really quick and getting immersed. And when you're working on those big media sites, you know, it, it doesn't take months to get results. You can see changes, you know, almost overnight. 
So learned a lot from there. And, you know, since then just continued growing my site on the side. And now it's, you know, the last couple of months made over 25 grand a month. That, that is awesome. That's, that's such a journey too. So how many, how many sites do you have now? Is it just that one? Yeah. So just the main one, I have a couple others. I have one that I'm kind of playing around with some programmatic SEO with. Um, and then in one other one, that's a hundred percent test site. I just run gotcha. SEO tests on it. It's gotcha. right now completely crashed because I was testing a bunch of AI. <laughs> no, fair enough. So let's maybe start with, with your one now making, I think it was 20 or 25,000 a month. So building that site out, what, right, without, I mean, you can share your niche if you want, if not all good, but what were your processes getting out? I know you did your, your blogging course, but what were the first things and how did you do them to start that site? And what was the, I guess, the end goal in terms of monetization and to make money from obviously some people come into these being like, I'm just going to do display ads and affiliate marketing. And that's kind of the lane they stay in, or they're going to branch out into digital products and things like that. Was there some kind of goal you had in mind with the site or was it just, I just want to see if this works? Yeah. So I didn't know for sure. So I just followed the course, um, legit step-by-step and really quick, not to get like too far down the weeds there. Um, so Shane shut that course down for a while, um, but then recently, like we've been talking, and we're actually going to launch something together um, soon. So if anyone wants to see it, I mean, I'll drop it <laughs> at the end. I won't say it now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to do something really fun there. That's a, a course in a community, and it's going to be uh, pretty cool. But yeah, I just followed his lead. I mean, the guy has a ton of success. He sold sites over a million dollars, um, and just you know, I've seen what he done with these media sites and how, you know, the strategy, the playbook that he has, and it just works really well. So it, it started off, my goal, I guess, was just to follow it blindly. Um, I started seeing, you know, a few dollars come in and they were from, you know, affiliate sales. So I went really heavy with affiliate. Um, and that's when, you know, I saw, you know, John Dykstra and all the, you know, content that he had uh, was, you know, following along on his blog and in YouTube and I'm like, I want to get some of that too. Uh, and Shane's course, I mean, it, it talks about informational content and the importance of it and, you know, authority. It just doesn't have a big emphasis um, on it. And so I was like, you know what? I think I can do both. And, you know, then checking out authority hackers, I'm like, oh, like this is normal to do both. Like this is how you build like a big site is you do both of these. So um, that's kind of the, the route I've taken. It went from being really heavy affiliate to now being, you know, pretty, you know, balanced, I would say, but leaning more towards informational content. Gotcha. Are you able to share maybe how many posts are on the site and how much traffic you're getting? Yeah. So, um, it's getting around like 250,000, uh, page views a month. Nice. And it has right at 283 posts published. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're getting, you're getting quite, quite a few, uh, visitors per post. In it. So what was your, with the, I guess you're explaining or sharing a lot of the course going into a lot of these details. So you don't have to go too deep, but what was the strategy in terms of content then for getting that much traffic from only 208 posts? Many people are looking to publish, you know, thousands of posts to get that kind of traffic. Yeah, I think the, the playbook starting out, um, was really good, uh, as far as finding a niche that actually has some data behind it, that, you know, you're not just picking something cause it's a hobby. I think it's important, at least in my opinion, your first site should be something you do enjoy writing about or talking about or researching. Um, but when there's data to back it up saying like, Hey, this is a good niche to be in. I mean, that's, you have to start there with the foundation. Um, but then as far as the content itself, it's writing content that you can actually rank for, right? Like I don't, there's posts now that I really want to write that have really high MSV and, and high, you know, affiliate potential, but there's no chance I would rank for them still. So I'm not going to waste, you know, the time or resources. And I'd rather write, you know, 10 other posts that I know I can rank for. Gotcha. And you mentioned at the um, beginning that it was very affiliate heavy. That was kind of the main monetization angle at the beginning. Does that mean you had at the beginning, just purely round up, uh, best post and kind of review style content. Yeah. So I didn't do any, uh, individual reviews early. Um, I was just doing roundups, um, and you know, some informational posts. It was mainly just how to and best of that was the whole site. Um, wow. and it was, yeah, 
And so, and even the, the best ofs though, they were, you know, long tail type of best ofs that nobody else was trying to, you know, write about. Gotcha. So what, what's your, I guess, strategy within those roundups? How are you structuring those? Cause, I mean, you're obviously converting them well and you're bringing the traffic to those pages. So you've obviously done something right on those. So is there, is there something that you're doing on those pages or is, is there a, a way or strategy that you use to plan those pages? Um, and then the way you write them to help them rank and convert. Yeah. And I would say I've learned a lot more since beginning, um, when I started it and they look a little bit different now than they did before. Um, I've personally found, so when I was first starting, I would go, you know, really short intro table of contents and then go into informational posts, you know, um, I'll just like the, the, the niche is more like backyard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let's say it's lawn mowers and it would be like, what's the best lawn mowers? And then I, what is a lawn mower? You know, all the history of lawn, all the stuff people hate seeing on a site. Yeah. Um, and it just, it's not great for users. Um, but also I've found that you're more likely to rank for the, you know, the seed term. Um, so lawn mowers, as an example, if you have products listed higher on the page, so mm -hmm. now that's what I go. The, the first like H2 is always like best of whatever it is. And then a bulleted list of, um, of the products with the superlative. And okay. a little hat, hat tip to, to Kyle Roof on that. The superlative, you know, is typically going to be a, like a keyword variation. And if you use that as the, the anchor text for a jump link, it's a really good signal uh, to Google of what the page is about. Okay, so that means you're doing your intro, you've got your H2, say best, just say, let's say we're doing best lawnmowers, then all those bullet points are like best lawnmower for this grass, best lawnmower yep. for whatever it is, and then those all jump link to the individual sections under that. Yep. Okay. And then after you've, you've gone through those reviews, how are you filling the rest of the article? Yeah, so there's a, like a technique that's more, you know, um, you know, that I use now. So you, you've got to look at what the competitors are writing. If everyone, you know, in the top five right now that are going after that term, if they do write, like, what is a, a lawnmower, you have to have it on your page. Mm. Like, love it or not, like, you have to have yeah. it. An answer. <laughs> the worst section in the buyer's guide that you, <laughs> you have to write. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's what it is, looking at, looking at that. You have to match what's already there, but then you also want to exceed what anyone else has. So a lot of times, you know, that's a comparison table. I don't know why, but a lot of people don't have those. Um, mm. But if you go look at any big media site that does a roundup, they're pretty much all going to have a comparison table afterwards. And uh, it looks good for Google. It's great for users. They convert really well. Um, and then always like an FAQ section as well, I think are important. Nice. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of those sections can, can be made too generic by people, almost like a generic informational post for a buyer's guide, instead of tailoring the points of, you know, things to look for in a lawnmower and tailoring it to the article. So if it's like, I don't know, best, uh, what are those lawnmowers that you sit on and ride best, uh, let's just say best sit on lawnmower. <laughs> and then your points yeah. would be about that lawnmower instead of lawnmowers in general as well. And cause uh, like you see it a lot in a lot of, um, I guess, lower quality posts. Yeah. So if it's like a, um, like a zero turn lawnmower, like I'm not going to write, what is a lawnmower? I'll write like, what is a zero turn lawnmower? Like mm. it needs to be specific and about it. Um, another thing that, that works well and that's kind of changed is the pros and cons section. Um, so for now, like if I'm hiring a new writer and I pay for a mm -hmm. like test post, I look at intros so they can mm -hmm. write an intro and make me scroll down the page. Like it's good, but then also pros and cons. If their pros and cons are the same things that you can find on Amazon, like it's not good. And, that, and you've got to use like the, uh, I made a thread about a long time ago, but um, the so what method. So mm -hmm. like, hey, it's your turn lawnmower, like you can make really sharp turns. So what? Like you've got to like yeah. answer that question. Like, gotcha. So you can mow your grass a lot faster using this. Okay, so what? So you can spend more time with your family. So this lawnmower, mm. you're not buying it because it turns <clears throat> zero turns. You're buying this lawnmower so you can spend more time with your family. Nice. You're adding, you're adding the benefits to the pros, essentially. So what, what are you doing for the cons then? Same thing? 
Uh, similarly, I mean, I think that any product has its downsides, right? And it's typically going to be something it doesn't have that, a, you know, a competitor does have. Um, you know, so whether that's, you know, a, a feature, I think features are really good to mention in cons. Like, hey, this doesn't have cup holders for your beer, right? <laughs> you can still spin that like, hey, like you're going to have to hold your beer in one hand while you're driving this, right? Like yeah. you can, you can make it fun and, you know, make it personable and show that you know what you're talking about. Um, and hopefully you do, hopefully you've got some experience there, but even if not, I mean, you can make it feel like you do and yeah. make it relatable. Um, I also don't ever try to have just one con that's newer. Um, I used okay. to load it up where there's like four or five pros and one con for each product. And it just doesn't look natural or real. Like every product has downsides. And I think it's fair to talk about them. Do you have different ratios then based on maybe where they are in the review? For example, your number one product might have four or five cons, or four or five pros and one con, but then maybe your ones, maybe just the ones you're mentioning might have more cons and less pros. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't try to do it like that on purpose, but usually mm -hmm. that's how it ends up. Yeah. Okay. And one other thing too, just cause we're talking about those sections, I'm kind of like visualizing it. Um, <laughs> Something that I do try to include on roundups, um, and you can go look at any big media site. Like, and I say this because like I've I've worked on so many of them, uh, and like currently I still work at Forbes now. I mean, not giving away secrets. You can go look at any site, and they're gonna have like a link, like an internal link, to a review of that product or service. Yeah. So I think it's critically important to have it. So if I'm reviewing, you know, a Honda, you know, zero turn lawnmower, I should have like a, like a link to my full review of that product as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing the same thing too. It's that's for me, that's been game changing. Just literally reviewing individually reviewing either the top few products or as many as I can be bothered writing <laughs> and then just internally link them all together. And that's like an easy number one spot <laughs> yeah. depending yeah. on the niche, obviously. For sure. Yeah, it works really well. Nice. And I'm going to be hitting you up after this for that Forbes link too. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say that's the thing I get messaged the most about. Like, I can I imagine. Get, I'm like, I don't have a link from Forbes. <laughs> I work on insurance pages there. Like I don't write about insurance. <laughs> Just put it in there anyway. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted, I wanted to cover as well. You, you actually uh, tweeted the other day about doing your email funnels and you talked about doing specific email funnels for, spe for specific pages. So for example, if they opted in on how to fix a lawnmower on that page, you would send them essentially a ser a welcome series, um, continuing on that essentially topic and you do that for different pages. Have you implemented that? Is that something you're still looking to do? What's the thought process around it? Yeah, so I've started to, and open rates have gone up quite a bit. Like they were around like 40, or click through rate rather. Um, they were around like 40% uh, open rates with like a 2% click rate, right? Like nobody was clicking through. And I'm like, how do I fix this? Like they're not getting, getting this. And it was still just kind of new, like, you know, 200,000 plus visitors, you know, in a month before I ever added an email opt in, which was a bad idea. Definitely get your emails. Um, <laughs> yeah, but. So like if, if they're on a page, like how to fix a lawnmower, the idea is to catch them in their journey. Um, cause if they're trying to fix a lawnmower, they probably need help, like learning how to maintain it. So it doesn't fix, mm -hmm. um, you know, so knowing what that next page <laughs> in their journey is just by knowing the niche that should be part of like your welcome email. Um, and it's not that every page necessarily should have something different. Like, there's probably an entire cluster where you know what the next step is going to be. And maybe yeah. it's one or two steps away. Um, and having a few of those and then, and then kind of filtering all, all of them back into one uh, email chain. I think <clears throat> so far it's worked really well. I mean, that the, the click percentage um, went from, you know, something really low to now it's, you know, around 15%, um, which I wouldn't say is like great, but it's, you know, a, a huge improvement for <clears throat> what I've seen so far. Yeah, I've actually, I, I do something similar, probably not to that extent. So we can dive into a little bit more, but so I have, I have seven different funnels or email opt-in funnels on mine because it's 
segregated by sport and then by um, essentially by goal um, within that. So it's like seven different things with seven different welcome series that all come back into one. So I can tailor, in fact, I think it's nine now, not seven, nine of them. So it's tailored to that sport and to that person who's on that page. And that's, that makes it a, a lot different, but how are you getting people to your list? Because I'm assuming just putting an email opt-in to subscribe on that one page isn't going to be do as well as maybe having something to offer like a lead magnet or anything like that. Yeah. So right now it is, it's just a pop-up like lead magnet um, to try to get them in. And it's kind of like just really generic. And so okay. that's where most people still go um, is they just get that and then they're thrown into the generic bucket um, just because I'm still kind of working out all the different funnels that I want. Um, there's only so much time in the day. So, Dude, I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> so then are you going to create something different for all these high traffic pages? Yeah, I think that I probably will. Um, like if it's, you know, if they're on a page about, you know, changing the oil, well, like I want to, you know, have something pop up that's about oil, like find the best oil or the lowest price oil or, you know, um, I don't know. I don't actually work with lawnmowers much, so I don't know what the next step would be <laughs> in that journey. Um, but yeah, just whatever that next step would be. I think on the high traffic pages is where, you know, the, the biggest impact will be. So that, so how does the welcome series go then once, once they opt in, you, you send them a welcome email and you kind of give them the next step, maybe another post on your site, but what do the next few days look like before they end up in like the big broadcast list? Yeah, so, so far, I uh, haven't gotten to add those in yet, but the the idea is to, you know, follow or not follow, but lead them through that customer journey. Um, because if they're, you know, wanting to fix their lawnmower, then, um, then they learn to maintain it and keep it better or how to wash it properly, whatever that might be. And then ultimately, I want to get a, an offer in front of them. Like, hey, here are like lawnmowers you should consider if yours keeps breaking. Mm. Um, you know, so... I think that's ultimately the the goal is to get them in front of an offer to make more money uh, from affiliate deals. Yeah, that sounds solid too. And Build trust. I mean, it's the like the Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, approach. Jab, jab, jab. Yeah. Right yeah, for sure. That's for sure. I wanted to jump into as well as any of your off-page link building tactics. I know you've you've posted a fair bit about link building. To to me, I think. Uh, link building has become more important than ever with the Google updates from what I've seen. Like I've got a couple of sites thriving in the current climate. And I think it's because of the links I've gotten the smaller sites that I have are struggling. And I think it, that's part of the reason too. So do you want to maybe dive into, I guess, any anything you've done or the strategies you've used or the, the things that you like to do to increase your site's authority and, and just get links back to your site? Yeah, so I mean, I've done a lot of the link building myself just through, really, there's kind of two methods. Um, one of them is is Hero. I mean, everyone does it. Yeah. I think that, you know, I've got it set up where I get, you know, it's filtered out. I only see those emails if it has a keyword in there that, you know, is related to the niche. And nice. I try to reply, like, immediately, like, as, first as, as fast as possible. Um, I have gotten way better responses if I'm, like, within the first few minutes. Of replying um yeah i mean just being first in the inbox i think is important and then i think the other strategy like i don't do a whole lot of outreach but i do network with a lot of other uh site owners um you know getting to know them and, and their goals and um learning how i could help them and then eventually you know if i ever have something in that niche i can reach out and a lot of times they know people I don't know. So I've gotten some really good links, like 70, 80 DR sites, mm. um, just from networking and, and meeting people and helping them whenever I can. And, um, you know, the favors usually return. That's such an under, what would you call it? It's never talked about in terms of link building is building relationships with other site owners, people in your niche, just people generally in your industry as a way to get links. Cause people are more than happy to, to help you out, link to you and stuff. If, you know, if you have that relationship with them as well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've found the same thing too. It's, it's always seen as this transactional thing. Hey, pay me money, you get a link. And that's kind of as far as it goes, but when you build it deeper, there's so much more value. Yeah, for sure. And it actually just um, like worked 
I, I don't want to say against me, but like against me, <laughs> um, I'd reached out about becoming an, like an ambassador for a brand, um, to get free products so I could review them with first mm -hmm. pictures and videos. And like, I mean, I try to do it legit, right? Not all of mm -hmm. them are just like writing, you know, based on Amazon and other reviews. Like <laughs> a lot of them, I actually try to you know, get my hands on. Um, but anyway, I reached out and they're like, you know, this sounds like a great idea. Hey, by the way, like you have this page over there. Like, would you mind putting up this infographic we made and linking back to our site? And I'm like, well, like, I can't say no. So, <laughs> so I did like, I linked to this big brand. I'm like, why do you guys care about my little site? <laughs> I usually do it in reverse. I'll, I'll get, I'll ask for product stuff like that. And then I'll also post on their site for links. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I asked, yeah, I'm like, Hey, yeah. I mean, can, can you also link to me? Like, how's this going to work? But, uh, we'll see They're, I mean, they're part of a, um, like a network of brands. So it might work out to get in a couple of different links. We'll see. That's, that sounds very good. Have you found Harrow change much over the past, I guess, six months, six to 12 months or so in terms of maybe difficulty landing links or maybe the way you have to write your responses. I know it's become a, a lot more difficult, a lot more saturated than it, than it was for sure. Um, recently. So do you, do you have any insights on that? I mean, I haven't, I changed a little bit. Um, so I don't know if that's maybe why is there's a lot more guides out there teaching people how to do Harrow pitches. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why they all look the same and are less effective now. And I changed mine not like too long ago, but um, where I just want to answer the question. Like I try to use their name if I can. Um, like, hey, James, so you're looking for, you know, tips on, you know, repairing a lawnmower, you know, and then bullet point tip, tip, tip. And then at the bottom, just a quick like, hey, you know, I've been mentioned on a few other big sites, like, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, lawnmower.com and you know they love the tips there too you know I'm happy to share this in my facebook group that's got you know twenty thousand members in it if you decide mm. to link to me just let me know when it's live <clears throat> nice okay and that that that's kind of bit, that's like your recipe for i guess high percentage of successful hair links yeah i mean that's all i do now whether it's i mean i don't know how successful they are <laughs> i've been trying to pitch a lot more recently than i took a couple months off and Regret it. Yeah, I, I think I've taken like six or more months off, to, off doing Harrow just got to the point where yeah. I was like, man, I cannot be bored. This it's work. Well, they're, they're asking for a lot now, a lot of them. Some of them asking mm -hmm. for bloody full blown articles on certain things. Like, for example, like within fitness, they, people want like, like uh, tips for deadlifting. And it might be like, they want to know how to deadlift. Is this deadlift better than this deadlift? What muscles does it work? This, and they want the whole bloody, it's like a thousand word article to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I've noticed that. Um, one of them asked for photos and I had to save them to a Google drive and like fill out this like formal document that I owned the photos and oh, uh, wow. they couldn't be held reliable if found out that I didn't. Yeah. It was like a whole <laughs> process. Damn. Yeah, I've done I've done one hair pitch where I, I filmed a bunch of exercise videos. For, I mean, it was worth it because it was for Live Strong, which is like, I, and the fitness area is one of the biggest sites. So I, I filmed a bunch of videos of exercise and stuff and wrote a whole lot of stuff. It was worth it to do once, but I don't know if I'll continue, <laughs> continue going down that road and spending that time doing it. Yeah, for sure. I will say like that one that it was their editors that made them come back and get the photos and all of that. So I was like whatever you already said, you're going to link to me. I already got the link. So I'll go ahead and do it. Um, and this was like a big media site, but they've actually come back and naturally linked to me again, um, oh, nice. without even asking. Yeah. So it worked out. Nice. That's the dream. And, and recently as well, I guess with the whole AI trend, we have, <laughs> we have chat GPT doing its thing and everyone either screaming it's the end of the world, end of SEO, end of these websites, whatever we want to call it. But, You've done something pretty unique and you've managed to also sell it all within a couple of days. Do you want to maybe dive into what you've done there and, and <laughs> everything else around it? Yeah, that was nuts. Um, absolutely nuts. And I mean, it literally, the, the agreement just happened like right before this call. So um, oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'd mess it like long enough that I could message like WPX to start the transfer. And um, anyway, yeah, so I, I was sitting there really just kind of looking, you know, scrolling on Twitter, um, saw just a bunch of people doing really cool stuff with, 
with chat GPT and, you know, I've played around with it a lot and had it write different code and like just different things. And, you know, I'm not a developer and I have no idea if the code was good. I was just seeing if it would do it. Um, and I'm like, man, this is really cool. Um, I've had it like do all sorts of things. Right. But anyway, I'm just sitting there seeing all these cool things. I'm like, man, this is cool. But like, I showed it to my friends, like on FaceTime, like sharing my screen and they just, they were blown away. Right. They're like, this is incredible. Like, like, the robots are going to take our jobs. Like they're going to take over the world. <laughs> and then I realized I'm like the, the general public, like hasn't seen this. They haven't been able to play around with it. Like they have to create an account with open AI. That's kind of a, you know, restriction. I'm like, why can't, why is there a site where they can just get on here and use it and try it out? Uh, and I'm like, well, I wonder if I can make one uh, where they do that. Um, so I, you know, hopped online. <laughs> and I asked them like, Hey, how do I, you know, connect? I had enough knowledge to know, like, how do I connect an open AI, you know, actually, I don't even know if I said open AI, I might've just said chat GPT API mm -hmm. to a WordPress site. Uh, and it mm -hmm. gave me like a list of things to do. I'm like, all right, well, real quick, I'm going to pause. I'm going to go try to buy a domain and I'm going to do this. Um, so I bought, you know, answers by AI.com. Um, and then walk through the step-by-step um, there were a few more steps along the way. So I had to ask it more questions and clarify a few things. And it led me basically to, to getting a plugin as simple as that sounds. And, um, you know, attaching my API key to that and doing a few other things and just kind of follow the steps. Right. And kind of tweeted about it. You know, once it was live, it, it took from the time the domain was purchased, um, until the site was pressed publish like one hour and 58 minutes. Wow. And so I tweeted about it and the tweet was like gaining traction the first day, you know, it was like 3,500 people saw it, you know, within the first 24 hours as far as on the site. Um, and then now it's been like over 17,000 people have been on the site. Um, oh. and it's still less than 48 hours old. So I was like kind of joking around and someone had offered, you know, to buy it. And, you know, they offered, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, no, nah, like I'll hold on to it. Like it's not, it's not worth, you know, yeah. it's not worth going through the house with transferring <laughs> this for a couple hundred bucks. Um, and then someone joked and they're like, I'll give you a, you know, a, a half of a bologna sandwich. And I just thought it was so funny. Like, um, and I just kind of like rolled with that and like talking about it. And then someone's like, I'll give you a dollar. And so then making tweets about people offering, you know, to it's buy like it. a live auction. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like a live auction happening. And then, um, I'd reached out to, Dave, and I don't remember his last name, but like the CEO of Jasper, I DM'd him. Mm. Like he doesn't follow me or anything like that. Like I just DM'd him and like, Hey, like, I think this would be like a good opportunity. Like I'll charge you like per impression, something super low just to cover the cost of this. Like if you want to advertise here and I didn't hear back. So I re reached out to, you know, Spencer of, of uh, you know, these pursuits. And mm -hmm. I know that he has a few other things like originality AI and just reached out and kind of told him like what was happening. And, um, just asked him like, Hey, do you think originality AI I would want to advertise here? And a matter of a couple hours, originality AI acquired answers by AI <laughs> for <laughs> five figures and a bologna sandwich. Holy shit, man. That's going to be the fastest, <clears throat> fastest business growth and sale in history has to be. I, I think it was exactly 39 hours, like within a couple of minutes of being 39 hours exactly from, you know, buying the domain to typing, like, I agree. Wow. And for five figures to that, that's, that's, that's an insane story to, and to, just a simple use case for the AI, just to create something that lets people use the AI yeah. on WordPress. I think the coolest thing though, <clears throat> um, I mean, with their team and, and originality, AI, what they're doing, like, I don't think that they're probably going to get a lot of use case out of this site more than anything. I mean, it, it just shows like with AI, like so many things are possible and businesses need to be alert. Like if you're going to be hiring freelancers and you want, you know, freelancer quality or high end quality content and you don't want them using AI and like use their tool to check it. Right. So I think the, the use case there is more for awareness than anything for them. Are you using any AI uh, with your current sites or, or in any way? No. So currently, I mean, on the test site. Yeah. So I loaded that thing up and I tried different, 
just about everything out there. And to me, like it was all really bad. Um, just, I was letting it write the whole thing, right? Yeah. Like a lot of the, these AIs out there, they're only as good as the prompts you put in. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, chat GPT is exactly the same way. Um, but I was using these and it just letting it write a whole blog post by itself and doing no editing and just seeing how it would do. And the site actually was getting a ton of traction in, in ranking for keywords. And I was like, wow, like maybe it's not as bad as I thought, you know, Google can't figure this out. And then the, the helpful content, you know, update came and it completely crashed the site. Um, which like, strangely, I think I tweeted about it, like strangely, like made me happy that they were able to detect that it was all AI mm. and you know, shit content. Um, <laughs> And so now, no, like I'm not using it at all. I use, you know, originality AI to check um, yeah. the writers who are writing for my site. Um, and so far, I mean, so good. Haven't found anything, you know, suspicious at all. Um, one of them I don't have to check because there's still like spelling errors. Dude's a great, <laughs> great writer. Like he really is. Like he knows what he's talking about as far as experience. But there are just some words like he just doesn't spell right. <laughs> yeah so um but it's you now it's been it's been interesting man, just seeing how ai's you know content's taken over what about you are you using ai no i'm not not using it but i'm going to probably start using it a bit more for landing pages and stuff because i don't want to sit there having to really nail out different landing. although i mean I've, <laughs> i think i'm still proc procrastinating on a few landing pages i gotta write and i'm just like <laughs> Maybe I'll just get into the AI a bit and prompt it a little and at least see if I can get a start on it or an angle of what I want to take and then kind of go down that road. Um, I was thinking about using it for YouTube descriptions as well, but I don't really give a shit about the description on YouTube. So <laughs> I'm just like, maybe, maybe not. So, yeah. Actually, let me let me backtrack. <laughs> so, yes, I am using it because I use it for meta descriptions. Mm, okay. Even though it's short, right? A sentence, maybe two sentences. Sometimes late at night, I'm just, I'm not writing this and I'll just type, I put a list of like the, the blog posts that I'm working on. I'll say, write meta descriptions for all of these keywords and put them in a table. Oh, and nice. Then copy paste. So, so what, what role are you playing in your business currently? It's, it's making a fair whack of money. You got some writers, so you're obviously outsourcing a few things. What's, what's your day-to-day -day role that kind of keeps your business running and essentially allowing you to scale? Yeah. Great question. So I am. <clears throat> Formatting, so adding some photos, um, original when possible stock, if, if not, um, and it just it depends, but usually adding photos, maybe a video, um, and pressing publish, you know, adding internal links, um, those type of things. So just kind of the final touches, making sure, mm. um, you know, I guess editing and formatting is what I'm doing. Um, and then recently I've started diving into creating YouTube videos, uh, for the niche nice. site. So I've done a few shorts so far for it, um, and have content planned. Maybe I should use chat GPT to help write these scripts. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been writing, I've written a couple of scripts and kind of planned out a few videos. Um, so pretty excited about that. That's where a lot of my time will be this year. Nice. We're, we're down the same path this year too, then with that, cause that's the same, same thing I'm doing there is. So I do a lot of editing and things like that, but I still write as well. I just enjoy that writing part, but I'm trying to push a lot of the social media and YouTube for just new sources of traffic outside of just Google. And that's one thing. So I host a, a podcast on my own site and I've been cutting clips of that for shorts, Instagram reels, Twitter, whatever else. And then same thing, scheduling tweets, doing, going, getting back into just normal long form informational videos. Um, just to be able to get more content out there for the site, man, it's, it's, it's almost like a hamster wheel, you know, trying to get mm -hmm. everything going. It's like, fuck, <laughs> there's just so much ways to do yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so many different things to do and different ways to attack it. And, um, I mean, running this stuff, I mean, I see, you know, during the day, like there's a whole team that it takes to, to make this work and try we're trying to do it all ourselves here. Um, you know, and, and it is, it's a lot of work. Well, so what's your process with your YouTube videos? Are you looking to do YouTube as a YouTuber with the YouTube algorithm? Or are you looking just to turn your articles into YouTube videos that you'll kind of embed back in and kind of have like a back and forth there? Yeah, um, a little bit of both. So hat tip to Matt Giovannici. He, mm. um, 
you know, his his content is awesome. I think it's just really good. Um, I think home brewing is cool. I don't do it myself, but it's something I, I could get into. Um, so, you know, Brew Cabin is their his YouTube there is really cool. Swim U, although I don't have a swimming pool, like I've watched so many of his videos there. And I think that's kind of the style that I'll take uh, where I'm not necessarily in a lot of the videos in case I do sell. That way, mm. you know, it's it's easily replaceable. Uh, I'll probably be in a few of them though. Um, so I'll just handle the, the voiceover. So at least there'll be some, yeah. I guess, personalization to it. Um, but I'm going to start, and this was his his advice, start with the, the pages that are already doing well, that I know mm. I'm getting traffic to, because that's going to get more eyeballs on the YouTube early on and get more views on those videos, which will then in turn help with the algorithm on YouTube. So how, how many videos are you looking to publish a week and are you going to edit them as well? Or is that outsourced? Yeah, I'm going to try to do it all up front. Um, so before, uh, when I mentioned like my girlfriend getting pregnant, I was going to school for media arts and science. Um, so I was like learning videography, had a little bit of introduction mm. into like website design, had created a couple of them, a couple of websites like using Dreamweaver um, and introduced to, to WordPress there as well. Um, and just a quick note, she was my girlfriend. She's now my wife. We've been married. Um, <laughs> this, it'll be 10 years this year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that worked out. Um, now we have seven yeah. kids. So. <laughs> Holy shit, you have seven kids? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. So we had we ended up having four boys of our own uh, that are biologically ours, and then we've adopted three girls as well. Oh, my gosh. We, we, we've actually got our first, our first baby due next month, end of next month. Oh, man. That's awesome. So, so yeah, it's it's full well, on. Congrats. But being be, yeah, thank you. But being able to work from home though and doing and doing this stuff is is game changing. I couldn't imagine having to go to work, you know, leave the house at like seven something, get home at like six p.m. or whatever, you know, Monday to Friday, and just having like what the hell? Like when do you even have time outside of that? Yeah, there is none. <laughs> there is. None. Yeah, we've, no, we've if, been through that. <laughs> if yeah, if you yeah yeah, there's no way. I mean, I work from home now and. <laughs> Uh, even still having, you know, a job and doing this stuff on the side, um, you know, I'm still limited with time, but I'm here and I can go help and, you know, change diapers and joke around with the kids and play with them, you know, and, and do all that fun stuff. But I get a lot of work done, like after they're in bed, I'm up all night. Oh, that, yeah. Let, let's go into some tips. There's probably some people listening, maybe they have kids or, or having kids like, <laughs> like myself. So I guess... What, is there any advice you would have for people in this position who are working from home, have kids, have the wife at home too, to be able to balance uh, family and work life essentially? Yeah, I think um, like the last couple of days I've actually worked from the couch, which has been fun, like being around other kids, um, but it's been a light like workload. I say that mm. I've like, created, created that whole site the last couple of days from the couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but it has, it's been light and, you know, I've gone to bed at a decent time, um, like before two o'clock in the morning. Oh my gosh. Uh, but usually I'm, I'm like after the kids are in bed, which is around, you know, nine o'clock, then that's when I hop on. Right. So after work, so five, six o'clock up until then, like it's just family time. Um, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't work at all during that time. Just try to shut it off completely and compartmentalize. I know I was, I said, working from the couch, but having a space that's yours and, you know, is separate is important to kind of get away um, and have that. And I think, yeah, just dedicating that time, like, hey, I really want to watch this Netflix show that my, my friends are talking about. So I need to watch it, you know, from my phone while I'm working. Like, it's not more <laughs> important than work, but I still want to, like, somewhat know what's going on with pop culture. So um, it's just finding those priorities, like building the site almost all of it has been done for like two hours a night, every night, mm. just consistently. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm sick, it doesn't matter I'm working on it. Like, had a bad day at work, doesn't matter I'm working on it. Like, somebody said my site was shit, I don't care, I'm still working on it. Like, <laughs> um, you know, whatever it may be, like, it's just consistently just plugging in and doing it. And um, for me, that that's well, and it, and it kind of happened because our youngest son, he was, man, I hate to say this to you, but he was two years old before he slept through the night. Okay. Yeah. And that's not normal. So I don't, I, I just really hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So don't let it scare you. Like that's not normal. Our, our other yeah. are not like that. Um, but for us, like, I know some people take turns, like 
Um, I worked with some people where, you know, Monday night was, you know, the husband's night to, you know, get up with the baby and then Tuesday, you know, they would switch on and off. Yeah. Um, and for me, like that just didn't, didn't work well. So what I would do, like my wife and I, we decided to take shifts. So I would take the night shift. So I would just, instead of trying to fall asleep and then get woke up by a baby and be groggy and not know what I'm doing or potentially getting frustrated, like, Hey, I'm just going to stay up until like two or three in the morning until he wakes up. And then, you know, I'll change him and then I'll go to bed after that. Mm. Right. So for me that like, it kind of started that process and I'm like, well, while I'm up, I might as well be working on something. Yeah. So the site is about two years old and it's because I was up all night. Like, Hey, I, I want to do something. I have a little bit of extra time. I'm sitting around doing nothing. Like let's make it productive. But now you're in a position where, you know, your, your site's doing well, then you can kind of, I guess, pick and choose your times uh, more conveniently because that money's yeah. coming in. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's sleeping and I'm not writing all the content. Yeah. I'm not doing everything mm. myself. So I would say I still work on it for about, you know, an hour to two hours every night. Um, yeah. And it's now it's working on more things I want to do and not stuff. I feel like I have to do. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I hope that for anyone listening, that it's a bit of, I guess, motivation, inspiration to, to build, to build your site to a point where you can kind of get your time back and, and have a little more control. So obviously when we're starting it, as Sean's talking about there, you know, like having to do that stuff, you know, a couple of hours every night, because that in the beginning, is just what you got to do to gain the momentum for your, for your site to grow. I know, I know mine's taken a, a little while, but now it's, it's starting to crank well. And it's take, I mean, I'm still trying to work as much as possible to get it there before the baby comes. So I've got even more wiggle room, you know? Um, but these are the things I guess we, we deal with in this, uh, professional industry now and it, but it's well worth it. I mean, doing this over, have your contract, a boss, someone to answer to having to ask someone if you can go home and do something or take time off. Like, no way. I just, just no way I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I think we, we cover pretty much everything here, Sean, but it's there. If people want to follow you, see what you're up to, follow all your crazy AI and other bits and pieces, where can they do that? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter, really active there. Um, it's, you know, my name, Sean Hill, but without the vowels. Um, so S H W N H L L. Um, and then also like just to drop it blog accelerator.com. That's where Shane and I are going to start building, uh, out the course and community there as well. Nice. So what's, what's happening with it? Cause I saw something about helping people reach a hundred K a month or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, myself, like the sites that, you know, I get to work on before working at Forbes and, you know, although I can't disclose, like we're talking two commas per month there. Um, of what I'm helping scale. And then, you know, what we're doing when I, at the previous company and some of those sites, like I helped one category go from, you know, $19,000 in the month before I started to over $250,000 a month within 10 months, uh, Damn. Helping scale and, and, you know, using that playbook, uh, and Shane's done the same. I mean, he's taken sites from 30,000 a month to over 200,000 and he's running a site now, you know, that's, that's doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, um, <sighs> as well. So managing a team of 22. So a lot, wow. of, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. So that's kind of the, uh, yeah, what we're working on and, and the goal. Um, so we want to help not just like people, no offense, like us, small creators, but like those people who have really big sites that like want to scale that, you know, maybe they're already doing, you know, a couple million dollars, in, uh, you know, a year in revenue, but they want to scale and use their blog to, to, drive more traffic like we want to cater the, to those people as well nice no that sounds awesome we'll throw all the links in, in the description as well for everyone who wants to follow sean and also see uh anything about that but thanks for coming on sean really appreciate it yeah of course thanks for having me thanks for tuning in and i hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening until the next episode goodbye